Was there? We find the leadership under that, that is established under King Solomon. This is right here is the prime of Israel's reign and. This is a nation as, that is serving God as their king, is following God's will and God's wisdom. So we, we see this list of leadership under King Solomon as it starts in chapter 4. And there's several groups listed. First you have, well it says in chapter 4, So King Solomon was king over all Israel. And then we have the list of the, the princes. We'll talk about these, we'll read through them later. It says, in verse 2, and these were the princes which he had, and that would be the elite leadership group. And then starting in verse 7, and Solomon had 12 officers uh, over all Israel, which provided victuals, or they say in the south, victuals for the king and his household. Each man, his month in a year, made provision. So these were the 12 officers. They were in control of agriculture and farming and and crops raised in 12 different areas. Of course, there's 12 tribes of Israel, so they probably each had a, a section that they were in charge of. These are kind of like Secretary of Interior type guys. Um, and, you know, you read about what you just re you read about what it takes to feed a nation. I mean, it's a big deal to feed a nation. So each month we find out that these guys... Um, were responsible for having, from their area, the food for the, the king and his household. And, and it talks about how much food there was. Um, look at verse 22. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 measures of fine flour and threescore measures of meal and 10 fat oxen. 20 oxen out of the pasture and 100 sheep besides hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl. That's a lot of meat, a lot of food. You say, well, he's a glutton. Well, it wasn't just for him. In verse 27, those officers provided victual for the king and for all that came into the king's table, every man in his month, and they lacked nothing. And also for all the animals, um, barley and straw for the horses and dromedaries brought they into the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. Uh, I mean, you think about food. Just think about your, your own food. I mean, where do you get your food? You say, well, I go to the grocery store and get it, or I order it over the counter or whatever. Look, somebody somewhere is growing this stuff and raising the stuff, and harvesting the stuff, and packaging the stuff, and distributing the stuff, and, and transporting the stuff, and, and selling it. Somebody did an awful lot of work so that we could just say, um, I want to go out and pick up supper tonight, <laughs> right? There's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes. I mean, it's a blessing. It really is a blessing what we have, and I don't know if you've ever said, you know, you look in your cupboard, and you got food in there, and your refrigerator, and whatever, and you say, well, there's nothing to eat. <laughs> what you mean is there's nothing I'm really hungry for today or whatever. I'm kind of spoiled. I mean, it's hard to understand for us that people throughout history knew that if they didn't take care of the animals and they didn't get out there in the field to take care of the crops and all, then they weren't going to eat, right? And, and even today, I mean, many people today, uh, you know, get up in the morning and not sure where they're going to get their food from to eat that day. And certainly it's been like that throughout history. I mean, we're greatly blessed, aren't we? We got it very good. And we need to count our blessings, what God's done for us. So Israel and Judah, they had this organized and protected agricultural system so that the, all the people could have food. I mean, you know, that if you look at the Middle East, that's kind of a lot of desert areas where they probably had irrigation just like they have now. I mean, they were a God-blessed people. And if you look in verse 20... Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude. Look what they did, eating and drinking and making merry. I mean, they were blessed. God had blessed that nation in a special way. So let's look at the system that God had laid out. 
And so first of all, you have the king. King Solomon, in verse 1, was king over all Israel, meaning that he, he wasn't just an authority, but he was, had, a, had a position of responsibility. He was the supreme ruler of the land, and he had a responsibility for the people that God had put under him. Um, now, he's, he's, a, he's a monarch. You understand how monarchies worked? I mean, he had absolute authority. Remember when those ladies came in, we talked about last week with the, with the baby, trying to determine whose baby it was, and the king called for a sword. I mean, everyone thought he was going to kill him, one of them. Because, I mean, he had absolute authority. If he says, I want you dead, you're dead. Right? If he says, I, if I, he says, I want you know, your daughter to be work in my kitchen, she's going to do that. Whatever it is, he's the ultimate authority. Now, he could have abused his authority and used people for his personal gain. I mean, he had that right. He, he could have used his power to, to advance his own self, or he could use his power to direct people for the benefit of everybody. Look, he's king. I mean, he, he could do whatever, life and death were in his hands, but he had that power and authority, but he also understood he had the responsibility to take care of the people that God had put under him, and it was a privilege. He understood that they were God's people, and we know when he prayed for wisdom, he understood that thing. So he realizes that he's the under-shepherd caring for God's people. He's the king. So he sets to work um, to use his position and his power to provide good for the people. And we see by the time you get to verse 20, I mean, everyone's eating, drinking, and making merry. So you have the king, the ultimate authority, who wants to do good for the people. And then Solomon had princes. And let's read about these princes, starting in verse 2. This will be like his cabinet members. And these were the princes which he had. Azariah, the son of Zadak, the priest. And we'll see that this guy had a, a, a position as as the head of the officers, Eli Horeth and Ahia, the sons of Shisha, scribes. All right, so scribes who would be responsible for keeping records and making sure everything's done decently and in order. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilad, the recorder, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. And we know who that guy is. We've seen him before. That's the general of the armies. That's the guy who had taken the position from, from Abner and these guys. So he's, he's the general. And Zadok and Abiathar were priests. Now, it's kind of an odd list there because Abiathar, remember, Abiathar was the guy who had joined with um, Adonijah in his rebellion against David. So why is he listed as the priest of there? Because it's a lifelong position. David had exiled him out, and he really didn't have anything to do, but he's listed there because you know, it was a lifelong position, and we understand that in our position as Christians, we're called priests, and it's a lifelong thing. You're, you're not going to be kicked out of the family of God. So Zadok was the main priest. And then we see this, uh, verse 5, and Azariah, the son of Nathan, he's mentioned in verse 2, he was over the officers. So he's the, the head of, of, of the Senate, these, these ones that are out uh, amongst the people we'll talk about in a minute. And Zabud, the son of Nathan, was principal officer and the king's friend. Now, I like that guy's name. We, we still use that phrase today, you know. Hey, he's my bud. <laughs> he's my friend. So Zay Bud was the king's bud, right? King's friend. I like that. My friend. Maybe he was the most important person in the kingdom, being a friend. I, the thing about friends, the Bible talks about friends. David had a friend. The Bible says his name was Hushai. And the Bible says several, several times he was David's friend. And if you remember Hushai, I, I'm thinking about friends. Friends are loyal. Friends are loyal. And Solomon needed loyal people around him. David's friend Hushai was, was loyal to David when, when Absalom took over the throne. Um, Hushai went in as an undercover agent and, and, and was working for David behind the scenes, if you remember. Um, yeah. 
So the Bible says a friend loveth at all times. That's, that's a friend. It's, what a blessing to have a friend. A friend you can, is loyal. Uh, a, friend is, a friend is there for you. The Bible says that Judah had a friend. His name was Hira in Genesis 38, verse 12. And Hira was there for Judah when his wife died. And the Bible says Hira, Judah went with Hira and they went out and into the mountain, maybe went some camping or something because a friend is there in good times and bads. A friend is there for you. A, a friend gives you good advice. Unlike the famous friend that, uh, that uh, Abinadab uh, or Jonadab, uh, remember Amnon had a friend and he offered him bad advice about, you know, he should, you know, rape his sister-in-law. No one, no one would know. So a friend should give good advice. The Bible says faithful are the words of a friend. So if you're a, if you're a friend, it's loyalty, it's being there for somebody, it's being, giving good advice. The Bible talks about um, that iron sharpeneth iron, so sharpeneth the, the countenance of a friend. Uh, a friend uh, is a builder, it makes you better. It builds you up. And a friend... Uh, Presence and serve Solomon all the days of his life. The, the days, there's, there's always the days out there. It's people outside the kingdom um, seeing what's going on. So these are the, they, they weren't in the kingdom, the, the Philistines and these, but they were outside the kingdom and they saw the blessings of the kingdom and they wanted to be a part of it, so they were giving gifts to the kingdom. Now, we looked at those five groups. I want to compare those five groups with, in Solomon's kingdom to the kingdom of God. With those five groups. Look over at your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Because here in the New Testament it talks about another kingdom. It's not the kingdom of Israel. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here it's talking about a new nation that never was a nation before. And what, what is that new nation that never was a nation before? It's, it's God's people that are saved by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ through the grace of God. So we're a new nation. We're a, we're a holy nation. So it's talking about Christians. And the same setup we can look at that Solomon had, we look at the, the nation of Christians, this holy nation. First of all, there's a king. Now, we have a king, and our king would be Almighty God. He, he's the king of this nation. He's the king of, of, of Christianity, this kingdom. Solomon was, sol was sovereign over his kingdom, and God's sovereign over everything. He's king of kings, right? And lord of lords, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 1.17, he is the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Now, it's kind of interesting because Solomon was the wise king, but God's the only wise God. Now, we saw how Solomon didn't abuse his power to advance his kingdom and to help his kingdom. Uh, you think about Solomon having an ultimate authority. God has the ultimate authority, right? God could do whatever he wants to do. I mean, God could just use us as puppets if he wanted to. I mean, he could be capricious and mean to us. He, he, could, he could just do, use us for his own gain. I mean, you read about, if you've ever read about the mythological gods, I mean, those gods were mean and and foolish and, and, and just did selfish things for themselves and, you know, these false gods. But God chooses rather to use his power to direct his people to do things to benefit other people so everyone is fed and everyone gets blessed. That's our God. I mean, aren't you glad that as a Christian your king isn't a tyrant? Aren't you glad that, that the one who's the head of this nation isn't a bully? Isn't mean? I mean, aren't you glad? Yeah, he's a caring God. The Bible says that 
Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, <laughs> even the God of our salvation. Okay, so who did Solomon then have directly under him as king? He had what? Princes, right? Remember, we just looked at it. Princes. Remember those princes, they had dual devotion. They're devoted to the king, but they were also devoted to the people to help the people. Now, if we look at this kingdom, that, uh, uh, the kingdom of, of God that the, the church is a part of, doesn't the Bible refer to Christians as princes? Eh, not directly so, but the Bible says that we're kings and priests. The Bible says that in this verse, it said that we are a royal priesthood. There's royalty involved in this thing. The Bible calls us Christians sons of God, right? So God is the king. If you're a son of the king, it makes you a what? All right, a prince or princess, right? So under the king, there's, there's princes, and that's all of us. We have a duty and responsibility, certainly, number one, to be devoted to our king, like those princes were. We were to serve no other master. We are to give allegiance to no other entity. God is to be the, the, the sub, we were to be submissive to that God. But as princes, we also represent him. There should be some sort of family resemblance, so to speak. The old like father, like son type thing. He's, he's God the king. We're, we're, his, we're his sons. So we need to have complete devotion to our king. But like the princes, we also need to be devoted to what the king is devoted to. So what is our king devoted to? The king, our king is devoted to the people of his kingdom. I mean, he cares for us. He has a plan for us. He loves us. He never leaves us. So the, it's being, so what are we as princes? We're devoted to the king, but we're also be, to be devoted to what he's devoted to, and that is ministering to others like those princes do. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, God made us able ministers of the New Testament. So we got the king, we got princes. Next on the list in the Song of Solomon was the what? Officers. All right, look over at two places in your Bible. Go to 1 Timothy 3, Ephesians 4. So we're comparing that kingdom that God had set up as an example of what a kingdom should be to the great kingdom of God, which we're part of. 1 Timothy chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 4. Okay, now this officer word is used. He called them officers. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office, office, 1 Timothy 3, 1, if the man desire an, the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. And, of course, a bishop is the, the, the leadership of the church that God has laid out. Now go over to Ephesians chapter 4. In this leadership of the church, what was their responsibility? What, what are we supposed to do? Ephesians 4, verse 11. Here's what God did. He says, verse, verse 11, Ephesians 4, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So there are officers that God has put in his kingdom, Solomon's kingdom. Now, if you remember those 12 officers in Solomon's kingdom, the Bible specifically says that, at least in chapter 4, their responsibility was to do what? To provide what? Food. <laughs> Food for the people, the, vic the victuals, right? The, the officers provided the, the victuals for the king and the, and the, and the people in the, in the king's household. So they was one thing responsible for feeding the people, right? All right, we're together on that? Yeah. So Solomon said, you know, I want my people fed, but I need princes and officers who are loyal to me but are also loyal to the, the concept 
of seeing people fed. Jesus says, I need my people fed. But I also need subjects who are loyal to me and also want to see my people fed. Now, spiritually, in the kingdom of God, this church, maybe not so much talking about physical food like it was in Solomon's day, but spiritual food. Do you remember when Jesus rose from the dead and the, the men were out fishing? And then Jesus took Peter aside and he asked Peter, do you love me? Right? Remember the commission that Jesus gave to Peter? Well, yeah, feed. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Right. So that's what we do. We gather together in churches in different communities, just like these 12 officers, to feed on the word of God. That's what we do. I mean, God's intent is to feed people from God's word so that they can grow and, and be healthy and mature in their Christian faith. So this is what God's plan is. So we have these officers. And then, so you had the king and you got the, the, the priests or the princes and you have, have the officers. And then there's the people. There's people. And we read in, in 1 Kings about the multitude of people. And, and if you go back over to our text in 1 Kings, just a reminder, what were they doing? The people. Verse 20, Judah and Israel, that's all people, were many as the sand which is by the sea in a multitude, and eating, drinking, making merry. Look, they're blessed. That's just a, a phrase of being blessed or eating and drinking and making merry. We're, they're, they're blessed because of a, of a compassionate king and devoted and serving princes and officers. They're blessed. I, I don't, I've always thought this thought, you know, nothing turns out right unless someone makes it his job to see that it does. It, it, things just don't happen. I mean, it takes a, we take a lot of things for granted. So be very thankful for the things that you have, that you're able to be in. We're, we're very thankful. Thank God for being such a great king that wants to bless us. And, and thank God for faithful princes who are out there trying to minister one to another and for working officers. And I, I would say the, the challenge this morning would be, may God help us to want each of us to want to be a blessing in this great kingdom of God that we're a part of. I mean, I, who's going to lay aside the, the making merry time to do something that would help others make merry? And who, who's going to join the ranks of the, of the servants to make sure that the multitudes are provided for? It could be any one of us. The job's wide open. It's laid out. What are the qualifications? Want to? Yeah. What's the requirements? Willingness? What's that old saying? One of the greatest ability is availability. Yeah. So this is the nation of Israel. Back over in 1 Kings 4. This is the nation of Israel in its prime. This is the plan that God always had for Israel. All the way through. If, if they would just serve him and follow him and obey him and, and, and go by his statutes and, and follow justice and judgment and be, be an example of him, then they could see his blessings. And then, as we saw in verse 21, other nations could look. And these other nations, verse 21, Solomon reigned over all the kingdom from the river unto the land of the Philistines, unto the border of Egypt. And they brought presents and served Solomon. All the days of their life. These, these other kingdoms, they, I mean, you, you look at that thing. These Philistines, all through the history of Israel, they've been at war with Israel, haven't they? It was always the Israel, Philistines fighting the Philistines, and the Philistines attacking here. And now the Philistines are bringing homage and worshiping there. And this has always been God's plan for 
Israel was, if you would follow me and follow my ways and my laws and live according to my statutes, then you will be like a light on the hill and the other nations are going to look at you and, and be in awe and be amazed. This is how it's supposed to be if, if God's in control. Yeah. That's what God would desire for our lives. And the Bible, you know, says that, you know, we're to let our light so shine before men that they could see your good works and glorify your God through, through what God's doing in your life. So this is the example. This is how it's working. This is the nation of Israel and its prime. This is the example of God's perfect kingdom as, as it's progressed up here to this early reign of Solomon. But sadly, Solomon's reign didn't last because Solomon's not a perfect king and he ended up straying away from his initial desire to, to follow God and to, and to have God's will in his life. And um, look, look what he said back over in, in chapter 3. He said, and remember we looked at it last time, in verse 7, as, as he prayed to God, he said, God, now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, but I'm but a little child. I don't know how to come out or go in. God, I need you. Remember, he's humbled himself. I can't do it. Ask for God's wisdom. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people whom thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for a multitude. And he's submitting to himself to, to help the other people. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. And who's able to judge this so great of the people? And the, place, the speech please the Lord. Now, if you notice back in chapter 4 then, Look at verse 29. Now, we knew that God had answered that prayer, but here's specifically what it says. 429, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart. So as Solomon chose God and followed God's wisdom and led the nation in God's ways, that nation was greatly blessed, and, and we just see. But he strayed away from God's plan, sadly, but... Matthew chapter 12, verse 42 says, a greater than Solomon is here. That's Jesus. And he's never going to stray away. And he has perfect wisdom. But when Solomon ruled with the wisdom and understanding of God, this is the results of the kingdom. And let's just look at some of the things. The, and this is going to be the result of the kingdom of, of God for sure. In, in chapter 4, verse 1 Solomon was king over all Israel. Don't you remember all the struggles that Israel has had? Even as we studied the great King David, there was divisions and the tribe of Benjamin still was looking back at Saul and there was contention. And this is a united nation. This is a unified country. They're all looking up to that one on the throne there. He's ruling and reigning over all of them and they're, they're just together and you know, this is certainly what God desires for his kingdom. And it's going to happen one day. It's going to be unity. And, and not only that, so then this nation is growing. Look at verse 20 again. Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude. This is just a, you know, a, a metaphor, an example. It, there are just a lot of people. You look at the sand. There's a, a lot of sand out there. Um, why is the population greatly increased when Solomon is reigning? I mean, it keeps growing. Why, why are the enemies, in, in verse 20, and coming to bring him presents and tribute? Why, why is it happening? It's because Solomon is governing the land according to the law of God. And sin isn't open. It's, it's not allowed. What does the Bible say? The wages of sin is what? Now, we understand that's a spiritual death because even people who are saved... Um, die physically, but besides that, the wages of sin is also physical death. I mean, people die before their time because of sin. And we understand that because of crime and because of, of a wrong lifestyle and this and that. Look, people aren't sinning. So people aren't dying as soon. And there's not wars. And the population is increasing. Look over at Proverbs chapter 19. So we talk about the kingdom that we live in. Proverbs chapter 19. Verse 23.
the fear of the Lord tendeth to life. (laughs) And he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. So the fear of the Lord, that's the beginning of wisdom and and, and these things. And that's going to tend towards life. And Jesus said, I come to give you life and that more abundantly. So, you know, this is all leads towards a more abundant life. So what else? Okay, so the nation is unified, the nation's growing, and we saw that there's ample provisions for everyone. I mean, this, just a lot of food. When you actually look at all of the food that was provided just for the king's house, like, you know, there's a lot of people involved in, in that whole thing, if it even included the, the you know, the, the mighty men and the, the, the palace soldiers and the staff and everyone there. But still, I mean, you look at all that meat. <laughs> if you're a meat person, you'd like verse 23 of 1 Kings 4, 10 fat oxen. I mean, how many people can you f- feed from one big cow? All right? <laughs> There's 10. And 20 oxen out of the pastures. So they had 10 of them that were fatted, you know, the... The ones that, what do they call that? The um, veal? The ones that are, you know, they're fatted. And they're prepared. And then other ones. And then a hundred sheep. And also then he mentioned the hearts and the roebucks and the, and the deer and the, and the fatted fowl, the birds. That's a lot of meat. Ample provisions. The Bible says in the end times for, for the church, uh, here's what's going to happen to Israel. Isaiah 35, 1. The wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose Uh, This is going to be a prosperous uh, world that God has for us. And there's going to be universal peace. Um, If you look in in verse 24, for Solomon had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tifsa even to Aza, over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about him. That there was, there was peace. <laughs> I mean, certainly not the world we live in now. But one day there's going to be universal peace. When Jesus gets back, when the Prince of Peace comes back, there's going to be peace. Micah 5, 4, 4. 4. It says this several, several places. Um, look at verse, uh, verse 25. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, even from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. And that Dan to Beersheba is, is, is talking about, that's from Hawaii to Alaska, north to south. Dan to Beersheba, that's the whole place. And they all sat, the Bible says, under um, his vine and under his fig tree. You see that, that phrase, that metaphor used several times in, in the Bible. Micah 4.4 4 says, in, in the end times when Jesus is ruling, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. <laughs> and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. There's going to be peace. You're gonna, you know, there's not going to be any fear. not going to be any locked doors. It's just going to be universal peace. Um, then let, let's, let's finish. What else? Talk, just talk about wisdom. So God gave Solomon, in verse 29, wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that's on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the East Company country and, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. And then he lists some men here. <laughs> they were probably very well known as being wise men. Um, Ethan, the Ezraite. I don't know. No one hears, thinks anything about Ethan the Ezraite as being wise. Now, if you look at his name, he actually wrote Psalm 89, penned it. He was wiser than him. And Heman, now Heman wrote Psalm 88 or penned it. And then it lists these guys, Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his, and his fame was in all nations round about. I mean, he was wiser than these guys that they're listing. I mean, we might say he was wiser than, I don't know who he would say, you know, who, who's, who's very wise. And he lists these names of people. I mean, Chacol and Darda and the sons of Mahol. I mean, 
I mean, they're really big stuff. Solomon's wiser than those guys. And now we look back and, huh, who's Maycall? Who's, who's Darda? Who cares? <laughs> no one cares anything about Deodal or, or Darda or these guys, and nobody's interested. And what, what, what we're interested in as we look back now is it's the truths of God that last forever. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. God's words won't pass away. And so these guys, well, they were very wise in their day, and Sodom was lifted up better than them, but who knows anything about it? And that wisdom was from God. It says, in verse 29, it says, God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much. That's a lot. And largeness of heart. Now, we understand that Jesus is perfect wisdom. But, you know, Solomon had wisdom, but he also had largeness of heart. And thank God, you know, Solomon, but specifically our God, doesn't just have all the wisdom but he also has a heart that's open and willing to show us the way to be saved and, and, and the way to get right with him, the way to have life more abundant. It's not just head knowledge, but his heart is open and loving. See it? Verse 30, and then he, and he says, the, the, the king's, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Then he lists these these big shots that once a time were wise and I can't talk about anymore. Verse 32, er, um, verse, end of verse 31, and his fame was in all nations round about. I mean, everyone knew about the wisdom of Solomon. Now we think about that. Um, don't you think that's true of our king, King Jesus? His fame. I mean, they may not believe him, but everyone knows him, knows his name. I mean, it's, his fame was in all nations round about. They may not worship him, but they've all heard tale of him. He's famous. Jesus is famous. And wisdom is productive, verse 32. And he spake 3,000 proverbs. Now, it doesn't say he wrote 3,000 proverbs. You always got to look at your Bible, Word Perfect Bible. Some places in the Bible it says so-and-so spake something. And you say, well, where's that at in the Bible? Well, it doesn't say he wrote it down. He spake it. So he spake 3,000 Proverbs, and a lot of them are written down in the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and even here. But, um, yeah, he, and, and it says, and his songs were 1,005, and he was very prolific in his writing. And, of course, the most famous song was Song of Solomon, which we're studying and we'll look at in the next hour. Verse 33, and he spake of trees, from the cedar tree that's in leaven, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He, he spake also of beasts and of fowls, of creeping things and of, of fishes. And, and, you know, he's wise. And he knew a lot of things. And you think about it, it's just overwhelming how much out there is that you could know that you don't possibly know about. I mean, what do you know about, you know, geothermic, thermic, or whatever these kind of things. I mean, what do you know about it? I mean, people know their in individual little things, but this whole world is so much to know. <laughs> so many things for which we're even clueless about. And then you think about Solomon. He knew he had all this wisdom that God gave him, but then you think about our king. I mean, he knows everything about everyone, Numbers the hairs of your head, knows all your thoughts. What a God. And that kind of wisdom is attractive. And there came, verse 34, of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. And when there's just something attractive about, you know, that's when, when people, Jesus just gave the word of God and the people were amazed because he spoke as one that had authority. So never be hesitant or fearful to answer someone with something from the Word of God. There's something attractive about wisdom, amen? All right, so, uh, chapter 4, very interesting chapter, and may God help us to be ones that would want to be officers and princes to promote our king and his ministries to others. God, thank you for your Bible. Thank you, Lord, for this chapter, the truths we learn in it this morning. Lord, we thank you for this, this fellow, Lord, who was a friend this Zabud, and Lord, I pray that we would befriend someone, and Lord, that you'd bless us with true friends, and we just thank you for your goodness, 
Lord, help us to, as we consider how you blessed this nation and these people because they put your principles first, help us to cement that truth in our lives. We pray in Christ's name, amen.